Aren't you interested in learning breakthrough wealth building strategies, such as how to flip a home in less than two weeks using other people's money with no real estate license, or how to build a low cost home based business? You can discover how to take passive income from any source and invest it into real estate, stocks, or business to become financially independent investing in any market with Residual Roads Business Institute. Collaborate with Andre and other Residual Roads advisors to create a free action plan and start implementing strategies today. Go to www.residualroads.com or email info at residualroads.com. Welcome to the Investing Uncensored podcast. You've been searching for different ways to become financially independent or generate passive income to live out your life's purpose as you've seen others do it, but need insight on how. Well, get excited because here you'll discover the tips and resources to fulfill that need. Andre Stewart has spent more than a decade successfully making it happen for himself and others. This is the Investing Uncensored podcast. And now here's your host, Andre Stewart. Welcome to another episode of Investing Uncensored. I'm your host, Andre Stewart. And today we happen to be sitting amongst royalty. Actually, <laughs> he's laughing because he knows where I'm going with this. We're fortunate to have Pete Reese here today. He is actually, go ahead and tell us about King Henry II and your connection oh, with him. Yeah, I'm the 31st great grandson of King Henry II. Man, that is crazy. That is that, well, you know, I think, you know, my daughter was, is big into Ancestry.com and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, she kind of traced her heritage all the way back and it led all the way back to him and some other people in that line that were kings and stuff like that. So I, I don't know. I think it's right. Well, you know, I'll go with it, though. That's why I put it on my bio because it sounds cool. <laughs> it does, man. I, I mean, I've never spoken to anyone anywhere, anywhere close to that. So that's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> there are probably lots of people walking around that just don't know it. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's funny. We're, we're going to get into a land flipping as a piece specialty. And maybe three years ago, you might, you guys might have heard me talk about this on a podcast. I tried to get into buying tax deeds for land in Florida, and it worked out well. I got a good piece of land. I only paid like thirty five hundred for it, and it ended up being worth ninety thousand dollars. So ninety? Wow! Yeah, ninety thousand dollars. <laughs> The guy ended up coming the day before foreclosure and we claimed it paid the taxes off, but I was so close to being able to take advantage of 90000 off of a $3,000 investment. So oh, man. Pete, <laughs> I know your background in land flipping. You, I think you said you did about $3 million in revenue from flipping. So, you know, tell us a little bit how you got started into land flipping versus, you know, regular traditional real estate and how's it going so far? Yeah, yeah. Well, I kind of I've been in real estate for quite some time. I was flipping houses in the early 2000s. That was mm -hmm. kind of our first foray into real estate investing. Got mm -hmm. my broker's license just because it gave me better access to the deals because I was getting everything on market, you know, on the MLS. Mm -hmm. And then the market crashed and I was like, okay, house flipping really isn't the best thing to be doing right now because all the buyers mm -hmm. dried up. This is in, you know, 2007-ish, you know? Yeah, yeah. So then I just used my broker license and I was like, oh, what's what's selling right now? And it was foreclosures. So I was, mm -hmm. I positioned myself as a listing broker for, you know, the banks, you know, an REO mm -hmm. listing broker. So I did that for a number of years and that worked out great. Not the best business to be in because it's, it's tough. Yeah. A lot of tough things that go along with that side of the business, but but I did end up getting hooked up with a kind of a, a bunch of large investment companies and I was finding deals for them for a number of years, just kind of, they were my only clients. I was just drumming up as many investment deals as I could and mm -hmm. they would buy them all up. So that was great for a while. Got out of real estate investing and real estate altogether for a number of years, building a business with my wife, wife regarding a blogger training and travel blogging. So we did that for a number of years and that was built that into a great business. But then I got the itch to get back into real estate investing. And I was just kind of doing a lot of research, trying to figure out what niche I wanted to focus on. Kept reading some stuff about land flipping, which really intrigued me. People talking about, hey, I bought this property for 10000 and I sold it for 30000 mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, well, that's pretty cool. I'd love to be able to triple my money on every single deal. You know, those numbers seemed, you know, reasonable. So... You know, I, I kind of just started doing every, all my research on that and kind of went all in, bought a training program on it. We resold our first land flip in March of 2021. Mm -hmm. And that first year, we did a little over 1.2 million in revenue and about 50% gross profit margin. So 
on average, we're doubling the whatever we invest in the property. So if we bought a property for 20000 able to sell it for 40000 after all commissions and closing costs. So that's kind of the benchmark. And then in 2022, ended up doing about $3.5 million in revenue and just shy of the 50% gross profit margin, but pretty close. And then 2023, looking to do $10 million. So, so I like the, what you're putting out with the profit margins. Can you give us an example of a deal that you did where you made, I guess, the most profit on, like, so you, like you said, you mentioned 10 grand and make it 30. Where are you buying these land deals at? How are you finding them? And what's your greatest deal you've done so far in the last two years? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're finding all of these off market. They're all off market sellers Mm -hmm. and we're generating all of our deals with direct mail. And we send out a lot of direct mail at this point. Right now, I'm Mm -hmm. sending out 50,000 letters a month. Yeah. And they're actual offers. So it's a two page letter. First page is kind of, who we are and why we're contacting them and what we could do for them. Mm-hmm. Second page is an actual one page purchase agreement with mm-hmm. their parcel number, their number of acres and an actual offer price. So we send out a lot of those and then we get the leads coming back in. Some people respond and say, Hey, you're, you're angry at me because we're, <laughs> we're offering too low of a price or something like that. Mm-hmm. And some people call back and say, I want to sell, but here's what it would take to put a deal together. And then you know, sometimes we're right on in our price and people just accept it. So it just, it, it's just one of those things, but we're doing them all, doing it all over the country mm. right now. And I'm trying to expand into more and more areas. Kind of when we find a groove in a certain area, mm-hmm. then we do more and more marketing in that area because we start to build a little bit of a team on the ground to kind of help us do the on the ground type boots on the ground type stuff. That makes sense. It's funny because, in, you know, you pointed out direct marketing. People think that that's dead. People think all of these are coming from social media, which is so false. Direct yes. mail is the number one lead source for converting deals. You know, people are still thinking that it's, it's dead, but it's not really dead. It's just very expensive. Yeah. So you say you send out 50,000 leads or 50,000, like, I guess, postcards a month. Just they're, on they're average, letters, yeah. how mm-hmm. much is that costing you? Just, I'm just curious. About 50,000 letters costs about $25,000. So if it, about 50 cents per letter. So okay. because I'm doing volume, I get a pretty good price on that stuff from the mm-hmm. mailing house we're dealing with. So yeah, it costs me about $3,000 per deal. So on, and on average, our average profit margin per deal is about 22,000. So okay. that's a good return on investment for me. Yeah, I mean, so you get one deal, it basically paid for your marketing, essentially. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that, man. You said your 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 greatest, your biggest deal so far Oh, has been. Well, biggest biggest deal was uh, we bought a 650, 656 acre property. Wow. And it was a great property, just that they had tried to sell it before and they just didn't have any luck with it. And we came in, we offered them a cash price. It was, you know, we're a convenience buyer. We offer cash, quick closing. Mm-hmm. We're kind of like trading in your car at the dealer. You know, you know, you're not going to get the top value, but, but it's easy, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so we're like that. We're the convenience buyer. We offer cash, quick close, and we offered them a price that, that they could live with and a price that worked for us. And on that one, the, the price was 315,000, I believe. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the only deals I ever did with a partner. Mm-hmm. Meaning normally I buy all these properties with my own cash and then resell them. But in this business, there are plenty of partners available always if you have a deal. <laughs> so true. And, and and how it works in the land business is the partner, the money partner, mm-hmm. they'll send all the money to close the deal, like 100% right. of it. Yeah. And then, you know, I, as the investor, brought the deal to the table. And then when it resold, we just split the profits 50-50. So like, I want you to elaborate on that because I have a book mm-hmm. called Real Estate Investing Diet. And I talk about how you can make billions of dollars using other people's money. You basically gave a scenario where you found the deal and they brought the money. So give us, give them an example on why you think that, and you've done it. So give us your your experience on acquiring deals and making a lot of money without using your own profit. What's, what's your strategy behind that? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's really kind of amazing. And if you're not in the real estate world, they're not in the investing world yet, you kind of think, of, hear stuff like that. And you're like, eh, yeah, that's probably not true. It's probably hard right. to find these people. You pr- they're probably going to check your credit or, you know, it's none of that stuff. Mm-hmm. It's all about the deal. You find right. a deal, the, the money, the money will be there. The part and, and in the land business, that's definitely true. There, there are so many people, you know, I have a community for land flipping and there's so many people in that community that are just like, Hey, I fund deals. I, you know, mm-hmm. if you have a deal, I'll fund it. We'll split the problem. You know, they're there. So, you know, in that situation to kind of continue on that example, we bought it for 315 and obviously I didn't spend any money, send any money to close the deal. 
Mm-hmm. And then we sold it, I think about four months later for $5.95. Mm-hmm. So there was some, you know, commissions and closing costs and all that kind of stuff. I think we each got a check at, at closing for $108,000 using about. none of yes. my own money. <laughs> and so yeah. guys, I talk about this in the real estate investing guide. I talk about wholesaling. That's basically, essentially he didn't wholesale the deal. He, he went and found the deal and he got an investor to come to the table and they bought it together. And then he ended up selling it later. You could do this. You could do this two ways. You can go out and find the deal, flip it to an investor and make 15 to 20 grand off the flip. Or you can do what he did. And that's kind of what I do in a lot of my deals. I'll come to the table with a great deal and then I might use hard money or just that person as the investor to fund the whole deal. And I have no problem with taking 30 percent or 40 percent or even splitting it 50 percent because all I did was put the sweat equity in and found the deal and gave it to the investor. And that's yeah. perfect. So. Based on that strategy, how often do you use that method? And I I know you just said you pay for a lot of your deals, but what's your advice on someone just getting started on using the method that you just mentioned? Oh, definitely. Unless you're sitting on, you know, a pool of capital that, you know, you've kind of put together for maybe some other business or something like that. You know, a lot of people don't have this huge pool of capital to start. So that's that's how they get started. Obviously, if I use my own cash, I'm going to make 100% of the deal. But, you know, there's a limit to how many deals I can buy as well, you know, because there's always a limit to how much right. money you have, no matter no matter where you're at. There's, you're always going to hit some sort of limit. So if you're just starting and everything, really, if you've got funds or you've got some sort of access to credit where you can kind of focus on generating the deals, mm-hmm. you split all these deals with partners and you're still going to be making an amazing return on your, on your investment. So your investment into the mail, basically. So. <laughs> I mean, do you... Do you feel bad about making one hundred and eight thousand dollars? I feel bad. Oh no, <laughs> I feel great about it. <laughs> right, he found yeah. the deal, brought it to the table. Yeah. He made one hundred and eight grand and walked away. Because, you know, to now he can go take that money and do whatever else he wants to do with it. That's right. I mean, think how many letters I can send now with that. You know, exactly. I can I mean, send that's... over two hundred thousand letters with that with that money, and exactly. then you know, how many deals is that going to drum up? So, and that's one deal, right? That's one deal. One deal. So, okay, then, since you did have the background of working with, you know, traditional or obviously foreclosures and not doing land flipping, what's the biggest advantage of sticking with land flipping versus someone doing traditional real estate investing? Well, I like land because it's very simple. And, and, you know, once you learn how to evaluate these properties, there's there's very few value add things that we do. I mean, sometimes we do like we'll hire a company to come out and clear some brush or we'll hire a surveyor or we'll get a perk test done on a property. You know, something like along those lines and pretty simple normally is the value add. You know, it's not like if you're flipping a home, you've got to hire a contractor, you've got to coordinate all these renovations. You got to hope that all the renovations go well and stay within budget. You've got to have a budget for the renovations itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of moving pieces in that and a lot of kind of unknowns. Plus the fact that it takes a while to get through that renovation process. Land is not like that. You know, you make your money basically when you're bond, when you get a good deal locked up. So, uh, so then, and then if you if you're creative in order to value add it too, in some case cases you could really kind of multiply that even more. That's what I was going to ask you. Obviously, with investing in real estate, when you're doing a flip, you add value, you force value by doing kitchen countertops, redoing the bathroom, things like that. How do you add value to a land? Flip. Yeah, there are a number of ways. I mean, I meant the clearing paths. That's mm-hmm. a very easy one, but that's mm-hmm. that's a that's one thing that actually adds a ton of value because a lot of these properties have been neglected or mm-hmm. you know no one stepped foot on them in maybe 20, 30 years. You know, they're owned by somebody, some you know, they inherited and they, they just they don't even live in the area. You know, right. so these properties have just been sitting there. They're completely overgrown. So what we'll do is we'll just hire a brush clearing company to come and cut paths through. So a prospective buyer can then walk the property and see what it is that they're actually buying. And you know, if if we don't do that, then it's just this dense forest that they came and walk into. They're just kind of looking into it, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's that's a minor thing, but it can have a huge impact. The other thing that's uh, kind of cool that you can do sometimes, some of these areas it's very simple. Not in California, but some of these states you can subdivide a property, do a minor subdivision they call it, which is generally five or less parcels. So say we buy a hundred acre property, you can split it into five 20 acre properties or whatever combination you want, and then sell off the parcels individually. Now the the thing there is that generally when you're buying a hundred acre property, the price per acre is lower than if you were to buy a you know five acre, acre property. Yeah. You know, so when you split it up, you're able to then resell it at a higher you know price per acre. So you're just able to 
kind of recoup that because you're sm- selling a smaller chunk. So one thing I want to point out with what he said, the value add, because I'm a lender. And so when we get ready to lend on a new construction project, the first thing we ask is it shovel ready. So what, but what he's talking about is when you clear off the land, that will add value because now the person who bought that land can instantly go out and do new construction. They might have to do some soft cost with like getting a plumbing and all of those kind of things done. But in essence, they don't have to worry about clearing the land. In addition to the clearing the land off, if he clears the land, he can sell that and make profit off the trees or whatever that's on the land. So he can make money that way. I don't know if that's something that you guys do. Do you guys take advantage of that when you clear the land up? Do you sell those trees and take that profit? Or what do you guys do with that? Yeah, you know, and I know that's a strategy of some land investors. Pretty much when we're doing our clearing stuff, it's just clearing paths. We don't oh, okay, like okay, okay. we don't do like the clear cut stuff. But a lot of the properties that we buy are considered timber investment properties. So mm. we'll try to buy them with all the trees and everything. So mm. then the buyer then purchases it as a timber investment and they may be ready to harvest when they buy it, or maybe they've got a few more years left before they're harvested and then they replant them again. So it's just kind of like a farm, but just for trees. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what area do you find this? And, you know, I'm from the South. So, you know, my parents live in Georgia right now. So I, I look and I see... And they they live on like six acres. And so everyone around them, I'm just like planting corn trees, different things. What do you guys see the best area is for people to look to buy land to flip? What 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 do you find? I think the South, that's just my opinion. But what, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, we do a lot in the South. Uh, okay. We love, you know, all those states. You know, the whole East Coast we really like, but you know, there's really opportunity in every area. It's just a matter of kind of getting a foothold. You know, as long as there's an active market, like things are buying and selling. Mm-hmm. There's people that want to buy land. It's it's crazy, you know. As long mm-hmm. as if you get a good piece of land and you can price it right, it's going to sell. No matter where in the country, really. You've got to worry about season seasonality type issues in some areas. You know, like if you're looking in the extreme northeast or you know the Midwest, North Midwest, or mm-hmm. whatever, you're you're going to have a hard time selling stuff in the in the winter time. Mm-hmm. Um, so <laughs> you want to take those factors into consideration. But but yeah, I you know some states make it harder. Some mm-hmm. states make it harder to do business than others. You know, like New York is one of them. It's a, it's a little more of a cumbersome process. Mm-hmm. California, a lot of people don't like doing business in California, although there are deals to be had here too. It's just, you know, the prices sometimes are a lot higher than some of these other states. So it just, it just depends. There's opportunity everywhere though. You know, and I meet land investors all the time that are working all these different areas. And I'm like, well, maybe I should prospect in that area too. I, you know, it's, uh, I'm, not opposed to, I'm not opposed to buying property and selling it anywhere. Have you ever thought to yourself, I wish I could get into real estate investing? You can change this as quickly or as slowly as you want to now. Imagine yourself networking and making new connections in real estate globally or buying an investment property in a market or country that fits your needs. People do. They know what I'm talking about. And now you can too with InvestFAR. Connect and join the network. Remote investing made safe and easy. That's the kind of thing with the Invest Bar. That's you know one of my companies is called Invest Bar. We make it easy for people to invest remotely. And so, yep. ideally, one thing that we're going to get into at some point in time is land. Right now, we're just doing residential because that's what everyone does because of all these TV shows, right? Fix right. and flip and all those. So that's the thing. That's the trend. And then obviously, commercials next. But I think land is an untapped market because you can't get more land, right? The earth is that's it, right? You you can't get that's it right. more. So I, I think that's one of the biggest advantages. And I try to get my parents to get into land investing in 2019. I'm like, they, you can't get more land. Like once we get it, you sit on it forever. It's going to always increase in value. Yep. So then I got some questions for you as far as five questions that you can give the listeners. What are the five steps that they should take if they want to become land flippers? Like, you know, one through five, what, what do you think? Okay. Well, the first thing is you've got to educate yourself. So you've got to learn how to the business model works. You've got to learn how to evaluate properties. You've got to kind of learn. The next thing is you got to find a budget, a little bit of a budget or a way to kind of fund your outreach efforts. You know, that would be in in, in a, with my business model, it's about finding a way to kind of set up some of the business stuff because you do need some of the, you know, you probably want to have an LLC, you want to you want to have phone answering service, you want to have different things like that. And then you've got to fund the mail as well. So you got to figure out how to fund that. And then maybe networking to find some deal partners. You know, when you do find those deals, you got to be ready to go with those. 
And see, so that's, I think I gave you three. What else would they need to do? Actually prepare their list and take action. You know, I see a lot of people like going down this road and they're like, well, that sounds great. I'm going to do this. And then they get stuck in the weeds and doing all these things and they don't actually ever end up sending out the mail to to make it happen. And then the, the last thing would be, I guess, after, if you've done all those other steps, and you've got the leads coming in, you've got to take take some risks on some of these deals. And, and that's where another place where people get stuck. They're like, oh, this is this yeah. looks like a good deal. I want to do this. But then they just can't pull the trigger on it. You know, they can't, they can't commit. But so you got to commit and you got to take a little bit of a leap of faith. And it doesn't have to be a blind leap of faith in any way. You can ask that community, like, hey, what do you guys think about this deal? And then you've you've got other you've got other people that are chiming in and letting, you know, confirming that it's a good deal. And that's the other reason. That's another thing that we do as part of our process is we always work with a local land agent or land broker to resell the properties for us. So we're always getting their opinion about what they they think they could sell the property for. It's kind of just another step of our process to, you know, we think we know what it's worth, but having that confirmation, those local people helping us out as well is a big help for us. It's the same, guys. You hear me talk about this all the time. Like Again, I'm going to mention the real estate investing diet because I have to because it breaks down everything that he's saying. It starts with education. And then for anybody getting into real estate, it's about your network. you got to have a network because one of the things that some people try to do when they get into investing, they try to just, I'm going to make money. I'm going to make money. They have no idea how to analyze a deal. And then if they did find the deal, they have no one to sell it to. They don't have a network. They don't have buyers. They don't have anyone to reach out to and ask those questions like what you're saying. So the first thing is knowing what you're looking at. The second thing is having a network, right? And then the third part, like you said, having the capital. But if you don't have the capital, you have the network to go get the capital to do the deal. And then you have boots on the ground. So it's the same thing with regular real estate investing as it would be with land. It's just a different asset. So, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head with it's the same exact thing, same exact principle. Yeah. And you know what? It's funny because, and I've, I've been guilty of this in the past, you know, like when I get interested in something, starting a business or something, I always have this tendency to want to do things myself. But Correct. it's so much easier to like climb on the backs of those people that have yeah, already, already figured did. out the stuff. Like there's been a lot of smart people that figure out mm-hmm. how to do this stuff already. So why would I why would I try to kill myself trying to figure it all out again? And probably not as good as you know. <laughs> people don't want to pay the money to get a mentor, yeah. right? They want to figure yeah. it out, but like it only it only makes sense to like pay the person to mitigate the risk for you that's already done it. You know what I mean? So instead of taking a Haircut of five or ten grand, eight thousand dollars, and then you don't have to worry about spending an extra nine thousand for making a mistake on a deal. You know what I mean? Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. So then, obviously, you said education. What books have you read that got you on a path to where you are? Because I don't know what your background is, but what books did you read to get to where you are right now? Had to be some kind of education. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I've got a lot of experience in in real estate, but you know the. I've a lot of books that have really, and there's a number of books that have helped me lately, but you know, everyone talks about rich dad, poor dad. That's a great That's overview nice type book to read. If you're thinking about real estate investing, something not real estate related. Another book that I think has been very impactful for me is the atomic habits yep, and I just read by it. James clear. That's a great so book. Good. And so you know, it, it really helps you kind of define systems in order to get you from where you are right now in order to get to, to where you want to go. So very, very impactful. I, you know, I did some, I bought a training program to to learn all about the land model and how to evaluate land and all that kind of stuff. So that was impactful for me, you know, and then I took that and I kind of tweaked it and kind of made my own variation of that system and and did it my way a little bit, but mm. uh, I improved where I could, I thought, I think so. <laughs> I mean, but two years into the, to, you know, land flipping, you're already at 3 million in revenue. That's a big deal, especially considering the economic climate and how the economy's going. That's a big deal. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. I, you know, I just uh, constantly trying to learn from from people that have done it before, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and from my own experiences, we're, you know, we're constantly learning every day on things. So, so with you having a background working in the foreclosure in 2007, 2008, I know you're not an economist, but what's your outlook on where the market is going? Because there's a lot of, you know, foreclosures creeping up right now. What's your outlook on that? Do you, do you see that with the economy, those are coming up on a rise like they did in 2008. And would you get back into that with some of the proceeds you have from land flipping? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's I, that's one of the biggest mistakes that 
and when I look back on my real estate career is that I got out of investing at the exact time I should have like went yeah, double down on it, yeah. you know, yeah. all those properties that people bought, you know, I was a listing broker on all these properties. It's just funny. I, I revisit Quadruples. some of these prices people bought these, these houses for, and I look at what they're worth now. And it's like yeah. four <laughs> times what they bought it for, you know, yeah. something like that. But I don't think we're in for a crash like that. I, mm-hmm. I do think that maybe a softening, we're going to be in a kind of a stagnation and maybe a slight downturn depending on the area for a while. Mm-hmm. But I don't see it falling off a cliff like it did back then. Like things were things were different. Though. Like the factors were different. I could be completely wrong. But if you're just looking for my guess, I don't I don't see it like falling off a cliff like it did then. So yeah, some of the that true crash. Yeah, that was a like, and it was because of the housing market for sure. Yeah. This yeah. time is a lot different. And, and, and I don't think we're going to have a complete crash like that, but I do see foreclosures ticking up and it won't be a housing collapse. It'll probably be mm-hmm. a, a debt crisis or something like that. Mm-hmm. And people will just, you know, cost of living crisis to where people can't afford to pay their mortgages, things like that. But it won't be, I don't know, like 4 million houses available for people to buy. Yeah. Like, that was yeah. insane. Yeah, yeah. Uh, craziness. Yeah, yeah, and and hopefully we don't have to do that again because you know obviously I hear investors all, talking all the time like oh I want to I can't wait till it crashes and everything and then, then I'm thinking to myself like I don't think they realize it's not just there's a lot more that goes into it. there's a lot of people that you know their lives are turned upside right. down and just a lot of a lot of hurt and a lot of anguish that goes along with that and it's not just about finding good deals you know you can find good deals in any market anyway, and you don't need yeah. like a like a crash in order to to, to capitalize on and that. And it's not just, and then all other areas of the economy are affected as well, which would, you know, generally decrease your, your quality of life. So I'm not hoping for a crash, but, it, but if there is some sort of like a uh, situation where prices, you know, really drop, then obviously I would be ready to buy and everything like that. I'm just kind of not hoping for it, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. It's like, you don't, you don't wish for the bad, but if it happens, you're in a position to take advantage of it. Yeah. 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 So. so then my last question for you is, because I'm interested in this too, I know you do direct mail to get the leads, but where do you go to get the leads? Like the, the, the contacts and you know what I mean? Because if I want to do land flipping in Georgia or mm-hmm. Florida, how do I find those? How do I, what website do I go to? And- yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a couple different sources which people use. And there's one of the, I have a contract with a company called DataTree. It's first American company. Mm-hmm. And basically they will, they've got a database of all the public records in the, in the U.S. property owner public records. Mm-hmm. And I can take like, a, for instance, I'll take a particular county. If I was going to mail Georgia, I would take a particular county. And then I would say, okay, pull up a list of all vacant landowners that are 10 acres above in this county. Mm-hmm. And then I would, I would I'd get a big list, maybe a thousand or two names, something like that. And then I would kind of filter out some of the obvious non-sellers could be like the city owned properties or mm-hmm. owned by the railroad or you know, something like that. They're, they're not going to sell to me. Mm-hmm. So I take those obvious ones out. And then we come up with an average price per acre in that county, kind of an average retail price per acre in that county. And then I may offer, depending on how hot the market is there, I may offer 35% of that or 45% if it's hotter county of that retail price, mm-hmm. put that in the offer, you know, with, with a little math, say it's 10 acres, then it would be that price per acre times 10. Mm-hmm. And then it, you know, it does a mail merge and mm-hmm. it spits out the letters like that. So each letter is customized and, and the mailing house that I use, you know, they'll, as long as I provide them the spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. They'll take care of all that merging and getting out the letters. I, you know, don't have to do any of that kind of stuff. So they do the skip tracing and everything. Uh, well, there's no skip tracing. It, oh, it's just okay, uh, okay. the public you know, on data tree. It, mm-hmm. The records that we get from there already have the owner's mailing address. Oh, so, nice. Yeah, and the parcel number and the acres, like all that stuff we need to go on the letters and to create that mail merge. It's it's ready to go. That's perfect. So Data Tree obviously has a monthly subscription. Yeah, yeah. I had I had to sign a monthly contract with them. I think they have mm-hmm. different plans where you can maybe kind of do one off type stuff. Mm-hmm. But I, I signed a monthly contract to get a better price per for the data. But there's some other ones that, that people use. There's a company called Priced P R Y C D. You can buy lists like kind of one off lists from them, and mm-hmm. they actually use First Americans data. But I think they mark it up a little bit, you know, because mm-hmm. you're. You know, Stuff you're like, not doing a contract yeah. with them, but but you can still get all the data and everything that way. And then there's some other list providers as well that do the kind of the same thing. Well, how many times do you guys hit them? I know when we do our direct mail, we hit, we try to hit people like two or three times, right? Versus mm-hmm. once because it's really not effective. But on average, since this is what you do on a regular basis, 
how many times do you hit them with the same letter? Yeah. When we're in an area that we really like where we're doing a lot of deals and we've got good people on the ground, then we'll send it out every three months. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's not bad. And, and that's because it's all about timing for people as well. You know, they may get the letter and they think, well, you know, I'm not quite right. Maybe someday, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who knows what the situation is, but maybe six months, nine months down the road, it's a good property. It's just the timing is finally right for them. And they then at that point, they will call and they'll say, okay, let's see what we can do here. I like it. So you, instead of them, you know, because a lot of times, I guess it depends, right? We're, we're sometimes going after distressed property owners, right? Mm. In your case, you're going after somebody who just has land. They might not be in distress. So hitting them once every three months, that makes sense too. Yeah, they'll see yeah, it consistently. yeah, it's a different situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's there's different lists you could build. You know, as a land investor, you could go after distressed landowners and do it more about the list or the situation rather mm -hmm. than the geographic area. And that's successful too. But it's just, I, I'm sending out so much volume and everything that it would be hard for me to kind of do this, get as big a, of a list as I want to by just narrowing by, down by distressed property owners, you know? So good to know. So then listeners are trying to build their network because that's the only reason why they would be listening to an investing gun sensor. I hope you are a land buyer. So if someone finds a deal, would you be interested? And do you have a specific criteria that you look for or would you look at anything? Oh, I'll look at anything. Yeah. Yeah. You send it my way. You know, I'll let you know what I can pay for it. And mm -hmm. I don't care how much, you know, if you're going to wholesale it or whatever, I don't care how much you're making. As long mm -hmm. as the buy price works for me, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm I'm good with it. So do you have a minimum and maximum amount, amount for, you know, most of the time now, I mean, I don't really have a set minimum. As long as it's a deal, it's a deal. But, you know, generally... Generally, most of the, my minimum would be kind of like 10,000 is the kind of the cheaper properties. I've done properties that are less in the past. It's just that it's hard to really make an impact on, on the smaller deals like that. And the maximum, there is no, no maximum because it, you know, I know if I, if I don't have the available capital to put into the deal, I've got mm -hmm. partners available that have, have told me that I've, they've got very, very big pools of money to, to devote to this if, if the deals come along. So guys, yeah, see, use his network. He's giving it to you. I've given you mine as far as buying residential real estate. So use Pete's network. Pete, how can they get in touch with you for information on how to send you deals? Yeah. So best place is to go to turningprofit.com. That's my website. And on that site, I do a monthly income report for our business. So every month nice. I do a report which shows like what we did in revenue. Mm -hmm. what we did in profit that month, what deals we did, like what we bought each deal for, what we sold it for, how many days we held that deal for, like profit on each deal, notes about it and what went well, maybe what didn't go that great. But anyhow, every month I do one of those reports and it kind of gives you some transparency into the business. You could start learning what it's like and, and if you can foresee yourself doing that type of thing. And then in those reports and on the website, I have got a link to my um, community, new land flipping community that we just launched in January here. Mm -hmm. So we're really working hard to build that. And it's already been really active and people are are learning and and I'm, I'm releasing a free training program into there, every, showing everything about my land flipping business, how to do everything. So, and then you'll be able to connect with funders and other people going through the same thing you're going through, learning how to do this land flipping business. Yeah. So that's, that's the best place to get a hold of me. Plus I'm on YouTube turning at turning profit. Uh, we've got a podcast as well. Turning profit podcast. So I do my, with my wife about real estate investing and land flipping. So I like it, man. Pete, Pete yeah. is the man. Three million in, in, in two years, guys. You gotta reach out to Pete. <laughs> Especially when it comes to land. So Pete, man, I thank you for coming on. Hopefully, we have a lot of people that reach out to you. I myself, you make me want to get back into land flipping. You know what I mean? Especially hey, because yeah, now I know great. I can sell you a deal. That's <laughs> right. Hey, hey, I'm always looking. I, I spend a lot of money each month to try to find as many deals as I can. So if you got any deals, send it my way. And I, I would buy houses or multifamily or anything, really, as okay. long as it's a deal. So hey, hey, like I said, guys, live where you want to live and invest where the numbers make sense, right? So yes, send send Pete your numbers and hopefully he'll, you know, it works out for anyone that sends you a deal. Yep. So, sounds great. Well, I really appreciate you having me on here, Andre. Thank you, Pete, man. We'll have you back on again soon sometime. That sounds great. All right. Take care. Aren't you ready to start a business or grow your real estate investing portfolio? If you answered yes, allow Andre and the expert advisors at the Residual Roads Business Institute to fast track and put you on a path to full-time investing. 
The greatest transfer of wealth in our lifetime is occurring over the next few years, and you can take advantage if you know what to look for. In order to be successful at real estate investing, you need to learn how to leverage your current resources to generate quick money, big money, and retirement money. Let Residual Roads advisors craft a plan to get you through these phases using little or no money in six months or less. Don't wait for a job. Create one for yourself and others. Go to residualroads.com for mentorship and for our free course, go to residualroads.thinkific.com.